of standardized communication is a very important part of aviation. It contributes significantly to safety and its air traffic coordination allows a much higher traffic density to be coordinated safely nonetheless. Mentioning the importance of communication, we might think of radio communication. The pilots who have experienced a radio failure once know what I'm talking about. But the possibilities of communication today go far beyond verbal radio traffic. There are a number of other systems that have expanded the spectrum of communication opportunities considerably and therefore make a significant contribution to safety in aviation as well. I would like to take a closer look at one of these systems today and by that I mean a system that helps air traffic control to identify and locate us. Are you interested? Then get on board and we are ready for takeoff. Affirm after crossing, turn right. Foxtrot Delta Delta Zero, wind 270 degrees, 16 knots, runway 02, cleared for takeoff. Welcome to Aviation Explained. My name is Frank Dreyer and today's topic is the transponder. By 1950, navigation and radar systems had already reached a standard that allowed the number of flights that could be carried out in poor weather conditions or at night to increase steadily. But the downside was not left out as the number of aircraft collisions or near misses also increased comparatively. In 1956, the voices finally got loud enough and a collision warning system was called for. But it was easier to demand this than to implement it promptly. So it took another 30 years before the first system could finally be introduced in the United States in the 1980s. At the end of 1987, it was decided by law in North America that all commercial aircraft wishing to operate in American airspace must be equipped with a so-called Traffic Alert and Collision Avoidance System, abbreviated TCAS. International airlines that wanted to continue to fly to America also had to upgrade the aircraft accordingly. In 1998, the ICAO, as well as Eurocontrol, they called their system Airborne Collision Avoidance System, abbreviated ACAS, decided that all aircraft with a takeoff weight of more than 17.5 tons must be equipped with the so-called ACAS-2 from the year 2000 and all aircraft with a takeoff weight of more than 5.7 tons must be equipped with an ACAS uh, from the year 2005 onwards. That has been 16 years ago and a lot has really happened since then. Today ACAS is the generic term of the concept of aircraft collision avoidance and TCAS is a system component of this concept. That may be enough to tell you about the origins because of the development and the range of applications of the first hardware up to the current standard of the systems used today could fill a contribution on its own. However, today I would like to deal with the here and now because that is what we can use in practice. I mentioned the word communication at the beginning and that is what this is all about. How do I know in my aircraft where another aircraft is in relation to my position and whether it could become a threat in terms of a possible collision? One option would be a very accurate radar system. Commercial aircraft are equipped with excellent radar systems and these are specialized for weather events but not for locating other aircraft. Military fighter aircraft have such precise radar equipment to identify other aircraft and their flight parameters, among others, altitude, speed and trajectory, because that's part of their remit, for which fighter pilots also have a specific training or special training to use these quite complex systems. In airline flying, such specific radar systems make no sense. It would take too much attention if one pilot constantly had to keep an eye out for other aircraft on the radar screen. But there's only one reason. Much more important is the fact that scheduled air traffic operates mainly on fixed routes, the so-called airways, and many of them run in both directions. So there is correspondingly two-way traffic. In order to avoid a potential collision here, there is an altitude staggering according to the so-called semicircle rule. But aircraft also have to climb or to descend, want to take off and land, or have to avoid thunderstorms. 
Regulation and coordination of air traffic is therefore necessary and important. Without it, the daily number of aircraft in the high density airspaces around the world would not be possible. The countries with their tra air traffic control facilities are responsible for this. In Germany, the Deutsche Flugsicherung, abbreviated DFS, has control with its headquarters in Langen near Frankfurt. In Austria, Austro control with its headquarters in Vienna. In Switzerland, Skyguide with the headquarters in Geneva. And there is always also Eurocontrol in Maastricht, which supports the other member states in European upper airspace, among the other things. By the way, air traffic control is a highly interesting field and young people are needed. Why don't you take a look at the individual websites? Of course, there is a demanding recruitment process because to become an air traffic controller, you need specific skills. But if you don't try, you will never be able to find out whether your dream job is just around the corner. Whether you're an air traffic controller or a pilot or any other profession, the important thing is that you know what you want, are prepared to do something about it and stand up for it accordingly. We pilots work with air traffic controllers every day and it's great how it works. Great people and it's always very gratifying when you meet an air traffic controller at an event or even by chance and now get to know the person personally whose voice you have worked with many times before. Radar systems have a certain inertia and inaccuracy because their target representation on the radar screen depends on how well the aircraft actually reflects the impinging radar beam and that the radar aircraft is not disturbed by ground reflections. Even if two aircraft are directly behind each other on the radar beam, the one behind becomes virtually invisible. This technology is therefore no longer sufficient to cope with today's traffic density and to guarantee the desirable safety. The air traffic controller needs more precise information. It's not enough for her or him to see a dot on the screen that is updated just only every five seconds. Why don't we take a look at how the, this currently works. In today's commercial aircraft, there is a system complex called surveillance. If you're interested in IKEA standardization, surveillance is part of ATA Chapter 34 navigation. In the Airbus 380, this monitoring system consists of two independent identical systems, System 1 and System 2, each supplied by a different power source to ensure system redundancy here as well. The surveillance system includes four units. Firstly, a terrain awareness and warning system. Secondly, the weather radar with an integrated warning system for wind shear on departure and approach called predictive wind shear detection. Thirdly, the traffic alert and collision avoidance system, TCAS. And fourthly, the transponder. Today, we want to start with the transponder because the TICA system, my topic in the next video, is based on its functioning. Aircraft radio transponders have been around for decades. Incidentally, comparable systems are also used in maritime navigation. In this picture, we see a transponder equipped only with mode Alpha and mode Charlie, a type used in leisure aircraft. I get to what the various modes mean in a moment. In this picture, we see the input console of the transponder of a Boeing 737-800, which in addition to mode Alpha and Charlie also uses mode Sierra. An aeronautical transponder is a transmitter that first of all sends out a four digit variably adjustable code on 1090 megahertz called squawk. In each column, there are eight digit values available, namely from zero to seven, which means that the spectrum of all the possible codes lies in the range from four times zero to four times seven. And this format allows 4096 different code combinations accordingly. And the whole thing is called mode alpha. This mode alpha can be received by their traffic control centers through their secondary radar system. 
A flight planned under instrument flight rules is assigned a squawk code on the ground when the clearance is given so that the airplane can be identified immediately on departure by the responsible ATC unit. During the flight, usually after the transfer to a next control sector, the next sector controller will assign the pilots a new squawk code belonging to that control sector. The following a few examples for squawk codes that have already been assigned. Mode Alpha 7000 is a standard code for flights according to visual flight conditions in Europe. Mode Alpha 1200 is a standard code for flights according to visual flight conditions in North America. And now the following codes have been internationally assigned by the ICAO. Mode Alpha 7500 is reserved in case the aircraft has been hijacked, should the pilot still have control of the cockpit. Mode Alpha 7600 is reserved and signals that the pilot has a serious problem with the radio equipment and is no longer able to establish radio contact. And Mode Alpha 7700 is internationally reserved for use in the case of an emergency. The pilot will also make a radio call with his, with his own call sign first and then mayday, mayday, mayday. As soon as 7500, 7600 or 7700 has been dialed into the transponder, air traffic controllers will receive an advisory message on their system. Mo Charlie transmit the flight level of the aircraft based on the standard air pressure 1013 hectopascal or 29.92 inches of mercury, i.e. the so-called flight level on which the aircraft is presently flying. A few words about it if you haven't heard of it yet. The altimeter is based on air pressure. If the air pressure changes, the indicated altitude changes accordingly. At low altitudes, it is important to set the current air pressure so that the height above ground or mean sea level will be correctly displayed, especially near the airfield for takeoff and landing. In cross-country flight at higher altitudes, there are no obstacles, but here it is important to ensure that all aircraft fly with the same altimeter setting so that the altitudes flown are the same for all and therefore the minimum altitude separations between the aircraft are not compromised. This is why there is a so-called transition altitude, which is noted on the aerodrome maps or airport charts. Here in Europe, the TA is usually 5,000 feet. In the USA, mostly 18,000 feet. Uh, in Australia, 10,000 feet. Below the transition altitude, we talk about altitude. And the altimeter is set to the current air pressure abbreviated QNH. Here is a brief example. This airfield is 200 feet above mean sea level. The air pressure for our example today shall be 1021 hectopascals. Accordingly, we set the value 1021 and read the correct value on our instrument. The altitude above transition altitude is called the flight level, abbreviated VL. As soon as we fly through this transition altitude, the altimeter is switched from QNH to so-called standard pressure value, which is 1013 hectopascal, equivalent to 29.92 inches of mercury. This ensures that all aircraft now fly with the same setting, no matter what the real ambient pressure is on that day. This aircraft is flying at flight level 310. Let's take a quick look at its displays. The input window for the altimeter setting now shows STD for standard 1013 hectopascal and the setting is confirmed on the primary flight display. This aeroplane cruises at flight level 310. It's important to know that Mo Charlie always sent the altitude of the aircraft based on the rounded value of 1013 hectopascals, no matter what pressure value you have set on your altimeter. Let's move on to the next mode called Mode Sierra. The introduction of Mode Sierra was a big step forward in development and a bit like the birth of Tikas. Now, the previously purely transmitting transponder also becomes a receiver. 
Each transponder and accordingly each aircraft now gets an individual fixed identifier consisting of a 24-bit address. This means that 16,777,216 identifier or addresses now available around the world and a mix-up between two aircraft has become impossible. Now the air traffic controller can send a signal to a unique identified transponder and request data. But we are still in the past and a lot has happened from the introduction of Mode Sierra until today. The S in Mode Sierra is derived from the English word selectable. What it means is that the air traffic controller can, if necessary, make selected data requests, i.e. the transponder does not transmit continuously on Mode Sierra. The Mode Sierra transponder are supplied with additional data and can therefore transmit, among other things, the current position calculated from the gyro platforms or GPS if available, um, the GPS altitude and the heading. And this does not only work from aircraft to ground stations. Aircraft with a Mode Sierra capable transponder can also interrogate each other's data and the aircraft collision warning system actually is based on this. In 2006, the introduction started with a new system called ADSB, which stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. The previously mode zero capable transponders in the commercially operating aircraft had to be modified. ADSB can now additionally be received via passive antennas from the ground, and as a result, the accuracy is considerably higher. This means that even in remote regions which cannot be covered by radar systems, future installations of appropriate antennas will be sufficient to receive the ADSB signals. Another advantage is that less electric smog is spread compared to active radar systems. And in addition, there is an enormous improvement in accuracy. A secondary radar system rotates approximately only every five seconds, which means that the signal is updated only every five seconds. Whereas the antenna receiving the updated data from the aircraft sent every 0.5 seconds and the data diversity has increased as well. The ADSB data are now broadcasted in addition to the data already transmitted by mode Alpha, Charlie and Sierra. The following data are now added. The altitude value is set on the flight control unit. The barometric pressure value is set in the aircraft. The roll angle. The track angle rate. The magnetic heading. The ground speed. The ground track. The true airspeed. The indicated airspeed. And the Mach number. This data are transmitted continuously on the transponder frequency 1090 MHz and can then be received either by a network of ADSB ground antennas, which is still being expanded worldwide, or by the secondary radar antennas of air traffic control. However, these data are not only processed directly by the air traffic control centers, but they are also bundled at collection hubs and distributed worldwide via satellite. You may already have seen this data. Do you know the program Flight Radar? There you can monitor at least the commercially operated aircraft around the world and what you currently see in this program is perhaps half of the aircraft movements that in contrast have been observed daily at the beginning of 2020. In 2019, there have been 11.2 million aircraft movements worldwide. If you zoom in, as I'm doing here at Frankfurt Airport, it's almost frightening how little is happening at the moment. All the data you can read here right now, and quite a few more, are sent via ADSB. This technology is a great advance and contributes enormously to air traffic safety. ADSB has to be installed in today's commercial aircraft. Originally, ADSB was to be mandatory for all aircraft flying in controlled airspeed throughout Europe and the USA by the end of 2020. However, the timetable did not work out because the expansion of the infrastructure is lagging behind. The new commitment date that I have heard of is 7th of June 2023. 
I don't want to dwell deeper into transponder technology today because we now have all the foundations to build on for our next topic tickers. I say goodbye for today. The next tickers video will follow in a week. Thank you for paying attention to me today. If you liked my contribution, I would be very happy about a like. With a like, you help my video to be suggested to other potentially interested viewers by the YouTube algorithm. If you like my insights into aviation topics, I would be especially happy if you subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. I wish you a great day.